your one-stop shop for strangely, horrifically adorable quadruped boop snoop aliens. It's V'ger, please. A hateful Voyage to the Delta Quadrant. My name is Joseph. I'm your co-host, Peter. I think this week, instead of uh, waxing philosophically about Picard, we should just get right into the meat of things. We reviewed what we watched an episode of Voyager this week to review. And what was it? Season five, episode eight, nothing human. I really like the premise of this episode. I think that it brings up some of the uh, oft forgotten Maquis feels, (laughs) you know, like the, the, the DNA of the first season that sort of slowly washed away. Uh, upon rewatching it, though, I was less enamored than my my memory served because it just gets a little it's just overstuffed and overpacked and it was trying to do too much. And and this ended up feeling a little heavy handed to me. What was your impression? Didn't we just do uh, a Joseph Mengele episode? Space Mengele episode? Like. I'm. Um... I would remember if we did another Space Mangala episode. The writer's like, room loves World War II, period. Yeah. Plain and simple. We, we, got, did, we did Space J, uh, J. Robert Art and Oppenheimer. We've done that. There was Jatral, which, you know, touches on elements here. There was the, what was it, Waking Moments, maybe? Was that the one where the uh, fucking space elf Mengalas were experimenting on Voyager crew members? Yeah, but that was... That, that's true. That's that was very space mingle ish. And there was also uh, the Vidians. We gave, yeah, we gave it up for the Nookie. Remember Ensign Durst bit, bit the dust and, and faces. That was definitely a space mingle. This is okay. certainly the you, most on the nose episode of Nazi experimentation that we've gotten out of Voyager. But these concepts have been touched on multiple times in multiple different ways. And I, but, you know, it's, let's let's break it down for somehow if we have listeners who don't understand the story parallel. Okay. So one of the most famous, like horrific bad guys in history was a, a literal, you know, Nazi doctor named Joseph Mangala, who did just horrific experiments to people in concentration camps, right? Like by all means, look, look it up online. If you have the stern enough stomach to read some terrible things because of how cartoonishly awful and evil this guy is, he, it, he becomes a perfect, like, we're going to do that, but in space villain without really having to change anything. Right. Like horrible, uh, questionable, if not, you know, completely barbaric medical experimentation bullshit. So when we say space mangalas, it's because this is such a trope, not just in Star Trek, but basically in any kind of science fiction. And uh, yeah, Voyager Voyager has had their share of space Mengalas, and this was the most direct one possible. This is the most Mengala. This is maximum Mengala. Yes, this is a 1.0 on the Mengala scale. Like so the, the space elf Mengalas were like 0.7s, you know, uh, Ensign Durst's uh, Great Demise was more of a 0.8, but this is a 1.0. This is a Jerry Taylor written episode. And her Jerry, last. Her last. Episode. Thankfully. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if you know, Joe, but I don't like Jerry Taylor. Uh, I picked up on that. Um, Like you said before, they try to do a lot of different stuff in this episode and they end up not doing really any of it well. Uh, And I think the biggest problem, as we will discuss for this episode, and it's been a frequent complaint of mine for Voyager, is they do a bad job setting or outlining the stakes of the dilemma they find themselves in. I think that started with um, whatever the space race episode was, where they had to build the Delta flyer to get to the MacGuffin probe that mattered for what fucking reason again. (laughs) And it's touched a couple of the bad episodes in this season. And I think it rounds out here where ultimately the major conundrum boils down to, do we use, dirty research do we use dirty research to save someone's life and it's such a preposterous setup that it it just finds me questioning the motivation of a lot of the the impassioned crew members we're going to have in this there was a great line that they could have followed through on with 
the Bajoran crew member, Ensign Tabor. Uh, you know, that like the personal horror element was strong. Like that is a great idea, right? Of like you you're using this knowledge, but you have people on the ship who like had personal contact with how monstrous this guy was, and it creates a personal conundrum, right? But I completely agree with you that the episode falls directly on your on its ass when it becomes like state like a a this grand philosophical discussion of should we use this this knowledge gleaned from a a bad source to do a good thing to which the argument that both arguments suck like neither neither side manages to present themselves in a sophisticated way and it leaves you with a bad taste in your mouth which which sucks because I think it's a prem- despite the fact this is our at least our third space mingala it the the premise had so m- much promise. Mm-hmm. So let's get into the the nitty gritty on this because we've been talking rather abstractly. Uh we pick up in the holodeck and this is a very special scene for me because we finally see how tall the holodeck really is. It's seven lights tall. <laughs> This is a big fucking deal for me. I and mean, I've, I've done some hard research on this. So uh, you've got the doctor standing against one wall. The camera's kind of pointed down and you see that he's turned the entire rear wall of the holodeck into a Microsoft slideshow, a PowerPoint presentation. Yes. And this is a plot angle they've been working for a while that he's got this big, silly space camera. He's been lugging around to get all these snapshots. And here's the culmination. Um, I love the opening scene. It was a real betrayal of how crappy of an episode this was going to be because I thought like, wow, this is going to be a fun, good episode because nobody's happy to be sitting here watching his incredibly terrible picture yeah. slideshow. They're, right? they're they're in their uncomfortable office chairs that got brought in from the writer's room. Straight up office chairs like anytime you see something that's just too recognizable as. Uh, and I want to take a quick diversion here. I'm loving Delta Flyer. I'm loving watching two people directly involved in the creation of Star Trek Voyager go through and watch all this stuff and hit so many of the same complaints that you and I (laughs) harped on mercilessly. And it's like watching them encounter stuff and just be baffled by it. I just watched uh, or listened to the episode they did for time and again. Oh, God. You might recognize as the candy corn tragedy, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Listening to Robert Duncan McNeil like blow up over how terrible the outfits were they put him in. He's like, was I wearing a dress with these ugly colors? I'm like, yes, you look like a candy corn, dude. <laughs> but they also specifically mention in that that the, uh, the the candy corn people just had like regular Beretta pistols, like right, the most non space looking gun possible. And and I complained about it uh, during whatever the was it Predator? What was the Nemesis? Nemesis, yes, the Predator ripoff episode. They just had like straight up looking FAMAS assault rifles. And way back in Candy Corn Tragedy, like all the, the alien dudes just had like regular earth guns. And they pointed out like where there was nothing spacey about these things. And when you have props that people can clearly identify as common day, everyday household items or easily recognizable as, you know, 1990 whatever technology it just completely takes you out of that sci-fi environment. And uh, yeah, these office chairs, man, I, I, it was stuck in my mind until we switch up to the bridge. Right. And you got Harry Kim sitting there and he's like, it's uh 2100 hours, uh, commander. Everything checks out. OK. And he's like, all right, I got you. And then there's a pause. And then Harry's like, uh, you heard me. Right. And he's like, yeah, I heard you. And he's like, they've been in there for two hours uh, for what? Half an hour. Basically, Janeway told Chakotay, listen, I don't want to be stuck in this slideshow forever. Like, if I'm not out in half an hour, set off yellow alert and get us out of there. And Harry Kim's like, are are we going to do what the captain wanted? And the deliverance of Beltran, where he's like, you and I were in there for two hours. And wouldn't it be terrible for us to deprive everybody else in there now of the same joy we went through. And there's this wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Fuck these guys. Let them sit through that terrible shit. I don't care. The the tenor of the scene is some perfect, petty, like friendly workplace kind of kind of bullshit that makes it so much feel more lived in. 
right? It yes. makes the show and the story feel so much more lived in because we're spending time with Chicote being like, yeah, fuck those guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make them sit through the same shit we had to sit through. They're not getting off easy with, a, with that rueful smile on his face. And it's that kind of detail that always helps with these long form shows that have the, you know, we've been with these guys for a while now, you know, and they've been by themselves that time. So for them to be, get a little familiar with each other and to be like, I'm going to fuck with my, uh, some my real superior frat officer, house antics, man. And yeah. When, my, when, some mild federation frat, frat house antics. When Chakotay laid that line out, I was like, all right, man, there it is chicote mvp season five that i i can't pass on schadenfreude like that like that was it was good and then finally you know things wrap up in the holodeck and everybody's getting out of there like what the fuck that was terrible you know where was that yellow alert chicote directly disobeyed an order like there was so much salt coming out of that thing that just a, a great cold open for us Presentation wraps. They have the conversation in the hallway about like fuck Chicote, putting him in the brig. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Jay was like, "Oh, I see what that motherfucker did. Mm-hmm. He's going to jail." Mm-hmm. And I think that's when they uh, have uh, Tom and Bellana go to the uh, mess hall so that they can like get some coffee and talk about how like one of the photos was Tom like having fallen into like a mud pit but Bolana somehow got like her embarrassing photo deleted or something like that and have a little back and forth and that's when suddenly you know the space hazard starts the whole ship starts to sa- to to shake i got to go back to the bridge and uh, they're about to be hit by some kind of energy wave here's where my other like positive thing to say about the episode is is that I love the premise of them encountering an alien that is so unlike their form of life that they just have a bitch of a time trying to figure out what the fuck is going on. Absolutely. That does not happen enough in Star Trek. Like this is the right way to do species eight, four, seven, two, where you have a non bipedal humanoid encounter, right? Like it's just as the space slimy lizard bug thing. And it's spacefaring and it seems like it should be, you know, just a in a universe full of possibilities. Like you said, why is there not more of this? I think the last we've gotten three of these. We had species eight, four, seven, two, whatever the fuck these things were. And then those uh, creatures from swarm. Right. Right. Um, This energy wave is coming at Voyager hard and Voyager tries to juke out of the way and they can't and it hits them and it fucks them up but not really and it downloads a data signal into uh into voyager they play it and it's a bunch of screeching and they're like well that sounds really weird and we can't decode it it's kind of a violent way to give us the message but maybe it's just a communications barrier what should we do and it's we got silly time janeway who's like let's go fly recklessly towards this thing and see if we can't help because clearly it's not a declaration of war or anything else. Like it, it just seems real uncharacteristic. Like we know nothing about this. It seems kind of hostile. But we're going to fly over there with our pants down. I, I don't know. Maybe it's at the same time that is very Star Trek, but it is very Star Trek and it's very like explorer E like uh, this wasn't overtly hostile. It was just strange and, you know, weird is our business, boys. Let's check it out. Sure. Nobody wants to get home, right? So. They fly towards this thing and they find the spaceship and it looks real crusty and alieny. And they say, well, that doesn't look good. One life side aboard non humanoid seems weak. They beam it into the uh, sick bay and we get our first look at it. And it's like I said, it's in reality, it's a big, large rubber bug thing that's kind of pulsating. (laughs) It, it looks both horrifying and adorable. That's how I would describe it. Like it's got these two little eyes and weird little nose and also kind of looks like a face hugger. It's like, uh, uh, aw, but you. Yeah. And once upon a time, I might have said, hey, it looked like a big, stupid rubber puppet. But having seen where CGI really is at this time in 1998, uh, i.e. a fucking train wreck as species eight, four, Seven two showed us. I was very happy to see a, a a practical prop 
portraying this thing, right? So the doctor's working on it in the uh, Tuvok Real Talk Memorial Corner. They've got a force field up to keep it at bay, even though it's all fucked up and dying. And uh, there's a little bit of conversation between Janeway and the doctor. And then Bolana Torres comes up and says, hey, listen, you know, we've got some preliminary readings off the ship. This thing's real alien. It's all controlled through biochemical interface, right? There's nothing really electronic. It's just a, an organic ship, which it's not the first time we've seen stuff like this. This is pretty par for the course for like insectoid races. We saw Gum 2 or Tin Man from that old uh, Next Gen episode. Sp- you know, the Space Mewtwo's, they have bioorganic spacecraft, whatever. And while she's in the middle of talking about it, <laughs> this fucking thing just... Just someone off camera picks it up and just throws it at Roxanne Dawson and takes her out. There's like these crazy cat noises, uh, as my wife pointed out. And down she goes. And then we've got a hilarious exchange where everybody's like, oh, shit, this thing just jumped on Balana's neck. The security guy. (laughs) What the fuck do we do? (laughs) The security guy who had been standing by the door, like picking his nose, like tries to snap to attention. Janeway turns around, goes to her security guy. This is, this is, Janeway's not that stupid, folks. All right. You might think Janeway's a big dummy trap queen, which she certainly reinforces in this she, episode. She, yes. She knows what she's getting into, and she knows her security division sucks. She knows her security division can't handle Frangi. They can't handle children. Can't handle being shoved. Can't handle being shoved. What's the last time they they botched something else pretty recently, too? That was a big one. Oh, it was it was the seven of nine multiple personalities like they were confronting her in the hallway or whatever. And this one guy was just like the most bustery buster we've ever seen. No, they they had another special guest that they had up on the ship that that slipped the leash and got a one up on him. Whatever. Anyways, this guy's going for his phaser and she's like, oh, no, it was uh, hopes and fears. When Arturis was like uh, trying to flip the switch and all the security people with phasers decided to go up and like try and manhandle him and he beat the fuck out of him and ended up taking <laughs> Jane Wayne. Like, we've got energy weapons, but I want to wrestle you. Yeah, Boink. She, <laughs> she had to look over her shoulder like, uh, OK, Tuvok, do you need a fucking invitation to like gun him downtown? Like, let's do this. So she looks at the security guy and is like, eh, you know, what? the last time I trusted you guys, I ended up in a space prison. So she like wrestles the phaser out of his hand and then she runs over. And at this point, the doctor's like, OK, we can't shoot this thing because it's got a pretty good grip on Balana. We might hit him. And as they're standing around talking, this thing like, I don't know, injects her with a probe or something. And before you know it, uh, we got our classic face hugger conundrum. The. Bottom line is that this kind of alien is more alien to their kind of life than the doctor is prepared to deal with. And he explains the first part of this. This explanation makes sense. He says, like, my hollow matrix is only so big. I am not an encyclopedia of every medical fact. If they did that, then I would not be able to function correctly. So there are some things that even I don't know, but that data exists uh, we just need to synthesize it some somehow into some form that's easily digestible. Otherwise, I, you know, I'm not going to be able to learn this fast enough to be able to do this. And where things fall apart is where they're like, oh, we'll just make another holographic doctor, which I'm sure you remember from Message in the Bottle is supposed to be fucking impossible. Yes. <laughs> but is suddenly 100 percent as easy as can be in this episode. Yes, yes. And again, Jerry Taylor sucks. Yes. The fucking crutch of so much of Voyager. We've only got one doctor and he's everything we've gotten. For whatever reason, we've never trained up anybody else in Holodeck College. And we've literally had an episode where we had a B plot that addresses why you can't make another one. You already had Harry Kim try this fucking thing with with Tom Paris, who's also real great at making Holodeck characters like and then in the course of five minutes, they completely synthesize a sentient uh, subject material expert with a with a sterling personality to boot like stupid. It's it's classic Jerry Taylor Voyager ram rotting of we need a special guest star that would not exist in the Delta Quadrant otherwise. So we're going to just whip up a new doctor in five minutes flat like dumb. 
right? And then we got to dumb down the fucking doctor, too, who's normally, you know, I think he's expressed some okay counseling ability, right? Like, there is a mental health component to him, even though it was completely absent in uh, the Cardassian murder cave simulator episode for Blonix was at extreme risk. Yes. And that ties into this too. Like, you know, Balana uh, is not keen on the Cardassians. You know that there's a big contingent of this ship that's like super anti Cardassian. And I get that a lot of times the doctor's callous, but he's just stupid. He's unforgivably stupid. Here he's like, all right, we could jam this database into whatever holographic candy wrapper we want. And I'm going to pick a goddamn Cardassian. And even Harry Kim's like, you know, a lot of people don't like Cardassians on this ship. I don't know if you've noticed, Doc, but like a third of the crew are people who literally used to kill Cardassians for fun. Yeah. Like they decided to become fugitives of the law so they could have the most opportunities possible to kill Cardassians. So maybe not this guy. You and could make the- it literally anything <laughs> We we could have brought Make a Napoleon. Lon, fuck it. We could have brought Lon Suter back. I'd rather have Lon Suter looking at me. You could have put Seska in there. Nobody seemed to mind Seska, right? I mean, yeah. Jonas once he found out she was a Cardassian, he was Maki. He was cool. If you want to, if you want a day Cardassian that people wouldn't give a shit about, go with Seska. But no, he makes this fucking Cardassian guy, Doctor. What's his name? Krell, Kell, something. Uh, Doc. Dr. Space Mangala is all I kept thinking of in my head. Krell Moset. Krell Moset. Uh, and I'm going to, here's, here's my head cannon. Why would the EMH pick a Cardassian to treat Bellana Torres on her moment of need? Revenge for his family? Bingo. Ah! Bingo. It's, it's not stupidity on it. He's still playing the game, man. There's still salt in that wound. He remembers his child dying on the hollow table from Parcheesi Squares. Where Should he have just whispered in her ear as she like objected like, yeah, you object to that. Same way I objected to watching my daughter <laughs> die, you fucking bitch. <laughs> Go to sleep. Yeah. And this is yet another uh, notch in the bedpost of um, Bellana gets victimized by AI. Um, <laughs> it's true. Oh, man. I read in the memory alpha. She had like a. Uh, that uh, Roxanne Dawson had a fucking terrible last time doing yeah, this episode because her, her dog died. I'm like, ugh, terrible. Uh, so he makes this uh, this program. They whip it up, they <coughs> spit. You know, no problems at all. And they get to work on starting to find a way uh, to get this thing off of her. Meanwhile, and it might come up later on, but like. You know, there's a lot of parts of Voyager where it's like, well, isn't that a coincidence? You know, how convenient. We're going to have an A plot and a B plot and this. The A plot is Bellana's problem and the the Cardassian doctor. The B plot is people up on the bridge being like, well, we still don't know if this thing's like really hostile. Maybe there's a lot of conjecture, right? But what if we replicate the signal it attacked our craft with and just send it out? Maybe it was a help signal. Maybe we can bring more of them here like. Janeway's really rolling the 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 crazy dice hard on this one. Yeah, and, and both of these ideas have merit, but they're so like dense ideas that they end up just being super half assed to fit them both into this episode. Mm-hmm. That's what's so striking about it. Like, I think the idea of them running into the this extremely alien form of life and trying to figure out how to translate or communicate and establish first contact in a challenging situation like there have been good star trek episodes that are about that like uh uh tarmac and uh, jalad and tanabra whatever that one from tng uh like that's a perfect example of an episode built around a difficult ability to communicate with another race right sure so, yeah, you can do really good storytelling, which is that idea and flesh that out to 45 minutes. Or you could just flesh out the the doctor is trying to solve a difficult medical problem and he turns to unsavory sources and he doesn't understand why other people have a problem with that because he's a he's a robot. Sure. And he doesn't have the 
context that someone like Bolana or Edson Tabor or Chicote are going to have about why this is a fucking problem. Both of those are good episode, fuck, great episode ideas, and they managed to combine the two and make them both shit, and that makes me sad. That's the Jerry Taylor touch. That's the Jerry Taylor special. I'm so glad we could get such a perfect Jerry Taylor episode to see her off, you know, to the fucking barge of the damned. <laughs> you know, like, I am so glad we're done and we're done on the most Jerry Taylor punt of all time. I also, you know, to the episode's credit, we don't know anything about these aliens. They this could be their first contact for all we know, but like. Anytime there's something so crazy alien that's still spacefaring, but is completely unable to communicate, like every single thing we've encountered with Voyager, with the exception of 8472 and uh, the Swarm, right? And even Swarm was kind of like, stay the fuck out of here. Uh, these are space bullies. Fuck it. We're going to go. Like the Swarm could still communicate with the rest of everybody else in space. Like, all right, you're you're, you're uh, complicated enough that you can space travel, but basic communication with uh, monkey people is beyond you. All right, whatever. At least they didn't put enough de- um, facts in for you to hold that directly up to the mirror and say this doesn't hold up. Uh, meanwhile, we got uh, Dr. Space Mengala. And at first I was like, man, this guy's got some real friendly vibes he's putting off. Is that Ed Begley Jr. in there? <laughs> That'd be a hell of a thing. It wasn't. It uh, no, it's not. <laughs> it was actually the guy. He um, I recognized him from uh, House of Cards. He was uh, one of the senators or something that Jackie Sharp screwed over. I remember he had a real strong line. He said, "You'll be an excellent whip, Jackie. Now get out of my office." But this dude's got a lot of charisma. And I think he does a good job creating a nice guy facade. But I haven't really seen enough Deep Space Nine to know, is there a way that Cardassians are supposed to really act that differentiate them from humans? Like, Vulcans are logical, and Romulans are ridiculously treacherous and cold and aloof, and Klingons are hot-headed and feral. Like, were there character traits or body language cues or anything that this guy was missing from what you would have seen out of a Deep Space Nine character. So the Cardassians, as they are portrayed on DS9, which is where obviously they're fleshed out, right? They they show up in TNG at first and then really they become, you know, explained on DS9 and their canon becomes more firm there. Same with Bajorans, frankly. Yeah. And the uh, – because I think in TNG, Bajorans were like just space gypsies. <laughs> Like first and and that didn't go over real well and then they like more firmly established no they're from this specific planet it's you know they're this highly spiritual group you know race and blah 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 so anyway Cardassians kind of run the gambit um you know they're they're supposed to be space fascists would be the best way to describe it their their race is subservient to the state Right. The state is very important. Their state is called the Cardassian Union um, family and, uh, you know, the, the your loyalty to the state is like a sp- um, semi spiritual sort of fixture. Uh, but they 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 run the gambit of personality from super deceptive, you know, slippery Garrick, uh, stern, militaristic gold Ducat uh, to, you know, very much more regular guys. Um, but I will agree that Dr. Space Mangala comes off as the most regular guy of them all. And that's certainly to the end goal that when confronted with the real hymns version uh, or actions that it, you know, creates this cognitive distance between the two. So we talk a lot about how hollow characters in our podcast, like, where do you draw the line? Is it okay to do this? Certainly, Jordy did it with Dr. Leah Brahms. How much does a computer know? How can you just be like, hey, take this figure that's currently alive and synthesize how they act? Like, how how can the computer do this? So somehow the ship's compute Voyager's computer out in the Delta Quadrant has enough info on this guy that it can kind of flesh together his um his personality and then join that with this expansive. Um, what's he, an exobiologist, right? 
this huge yeah. database. Most of the material in that database came from his research. And that's kind of why I think the doctor chose, hey, we're going to have this guy. But it's stupid. Again, the, all of the information is already in the computer, right? He could have picked a fucking holographic fire hydrant that talked. He could have picked Frylock from Aqua Teen Hunger Force. From Aqua Teen. <laughs> they could have had Dana Snyder uh, in a CGI cup standing there talking to him with all the same information. And and it's silly as we get later in the episode, people are like, hey, I've got ethical problems with this guy, with the with the, the holographic container you're presenting this information. And he's like, no, we're going to keep this, whatever. Uh, so this guy is real friendly, real nice. They start talking. Okay, I think, you know, we've got a good chance at this. They lay down some like low-key menacing traits like... Later on, they'll be uh, doing some tests on a holographic bug creature. And he's like, here, you know, let's do an incision and check out the anatomy. And the doctor's like, well, why aren't we using a laser scalpel? Why are you using this big, wicked ass knife? Which- <laughs> yeah, why are you using this clearly villainous looking knife? <laughs> Total checkoff gun failure on that. I thought for sure by the end of this episode, the hologram was going to go like rogue evil and try to stab someone in the back with this fucking like wicked ass i know what you did yeah, last it looks like a fucking flaw. kukri knife <laughs> he's like yeah i like to i like to feel the flesh as i cut into it it's like oh okay you're not fucking evil at all no, yeah like uh, okay well you're a bad guy you yeah, need to understand clearly the- upstanding fucking citizen that has those knives that's perfect that's great yeah, good cool. 10 out of 10 yeah here babysit my kids while you're at it this is mm-hmm. fine not gonna it's, everything's gonna be fine they're not gonna be missing kidneys let's That's go back to my laboratory happen. which is in the sewer <laughs> but we all float down here yeah <laughs> like, come fuck on so uh this bug thing's a real head scratcher there's two doctors now working on it and then i started thinking like it's interesting that the borg have no assimilation data on this and like and i was about to question for a minute like if seven of nine was even going to be in it we haven't been keeping track in a while like when characters don't actually appear or do anything seven's not in a ton of this which is fine but what she is there for is apparently when the chief engineer is away that captain janeway hates the starfleet members <laughs> of <laughs> engineering that so much that your first choice is a maquis and then your second choice is a Borg drone. Yeah, poor fucking Joe Carey. You know, <laughs> like whatever the, the race between him and Torres was, Torres, you know, a lot of times when you're the boss and you have to like hire someone, you're like, well, part of hiring people is like building up one person then kind of tearing down someone else. Yeah. And if you have to like go yeah. back around and be like, oh, fuck, we need another person. Well, I can't use any of these candidates because I already convinced myself that these guys suck. And this other guy I did pick was the best. So like, Carrie is just in the trash pile forever. Yeah, that that man's entire career must be unrecoverable. How would you like to be him? Like, go home after a long day. You know, take orders from the terrorists that technically you outrank who broke your nose, who broke your nose. And like then like maybe also threw a ashtray at your ankles furiously at one time. You never know. And then you're like, oh, here's my time to shine. I'm I'm obviously second command. And then, you know, fucking Barbie Mc. A uh, Borg drone comes down the stairs and says, you know, I am now in charge, even though I'm not even wearing a fucking uniform. Do not what I say. Not even wearing a uniform. Now, yeah, who you would drink it? yourself. You would drink yourself into a stupor. Sure. Um, he's off crying on uh, Howdy Doody's shoulders, wherever the fuck they're going. <laughs> Again, that's such a failing for Voyager is you've got this closed ecosystem of of characters right and instead of like developing stronger secondary or tertiary characters they just they're so disposable that by the time you learn someone's name it's only because they're going to die or some tragedy is going to involve them um but speaking of people whose name you learn while uh seven of nine is in charge of engineering that's when we uh meet young ensign tabor who is a clear maquis member it's got the provisional rank pin and also is Bajorant and also can't t- don't take no shit from no one. And is also a huge crybaby. This guy uh, played by a terrible actor. <laughs> I don't know how to describe like I I wonder why they paid this man. Like, did they that is it that these the only takes they could get? Like, he is terrible. I didn't. Well, first of all, let me go ahead and, and remind you of Raffi and the true face of terror. I mean, he's not that bad. <laughs> oh, wow. You know, I got to hand it to you, Peter. 
perspective. That just changed my mind. <laughs> like, it could be worse. This could be Raffi. Yeah. Go on. I He's got some clear trauma in this. And when I say he's a big crybaby, it's not that, you know, oh, my family was tortured to death like that. That's a legit plot point for this guy. But like our first introduction is seven of nine trying to get like readings off of this ship and starts issuing orders. And she starts getting this fucking pushback from this this little Johnny nobody who's like, yeah, I heard you the first time. And she's like, well, is there a problem? And he's like, well, you know, you're not really in charge. Oh, the captain said I was in charge when Bolana's not here. Well, you know, Bolana doesn't. Yes, I know Bolana doesn't like me and I don't care if you don't like me either. Just fucking follow orders, which. Nice job, Seven, laying down the law. You know, this guy, maybe he was around the first time Blunt, or, uh, Seven was in charge back in the Omega Directive where she tried giving people, like, board designations. I could understand, you know, people not caring for that. But in this case, it just seems needlessly bitchy of this guy. And he will continue throughout the episode. I, I figured it was a one and done, but, like, he'll pop back up later because he's going to be the guy who eventually figures out who Dr. Space Mengele is and starts casting doubt on a lot of stuff. And like, you just, you can't make this guy happy. Like he's, <laughs> uh, he's so upset that Bolana's not there in Boston. She doesn't want seven of nine to be his boss, but then, you know, Bolana's going to die, but he doesn't want Bolana to live. Cause it means acknowledging that this other guy, you know, isn't, uh, the most terrible person ever and deleted on the spot. Like there's just no the, making this guy happy. The one thing I did like was the one scene he had with Chicote, where he's like throwing back in the face of the Federation. Like if all of this stuff is supposed to matter and they choose to not let it matter now, then it never mattered. And it, that was like the one effective scene, semi-effective scene about that part of the premise that they managed to deliver and it's short and it involves just two characters and then it doesn't matter anymore uh but so uh it ends in uh joy killer uh, <laughs> you know he he ends up actually i don't know if much really happens between at that point and when he actually finds out it's space mangala the ship blows up and yeah, the other the other guy's ship blows up and they're like, oh, oh, no, what do we do now? We're fucked. Now we have no option but to operate on this thing. We've thrown this Hail Mary pass to try and get the species to come to us, which for all we know, they're going to show up ready for war. Who knows? But uh, there's no additional information. And we are now stuck in a position where this thing is like a parasite on Balana and she is going to die if we don't get it off. And the clock is on. Eventually. I don't know. They they bring the Cardassian. I don't know. The, the, this Bay Jordan kid ends up in sick bay. He sees Dr. Krell says, oh, shit, I know this guy. Uh, and he's a terrible person who has uh, done unconsciousable, um, you know, just unforgivable horrors and atrocities. This guy's a war criminal. And it's it's a setup of. All right. I did. uh bulk tests on the general populace to try and cure whatever terrible plague was going around. And because I was as aggressive with Bajoran life as I was up front, I was able to produce the cure. And for the cure, I was lauded and uh, given all these awards. Uh, but my atrocities were never really cataloged formally by the Federation. So the Federation database wasn't aware. And that's that's where this whole thing starts getting real muddy. Like, had this been the actual doctor who pulled this nasty ass raw shit, a lot of these complaints would have resonated stronger. But he's just a fucking hologram, right? He's just a, a walking blender with this database attached. And the crew gets very emotional and very stern, like this program should be deleted immediately. And all of the research associated with this person should also be deleted immediately while we have our chief engineer dying on the operating table and it requires this information to save her life. And also the another person who's in favor of this is Bolana, who is literally saying, I would rather fucking die than allow even the fa a, a, a photonic facsimile of something that looks like a Cardassian treat me, you know, mind you. It's just the accumulation of the ship's xenobiological database into a personality, right? It's not actually Krell Moset. 
it has his personality, but none of his actual, like, you know, memory. It just use it uses his the known things of his life to construct the the af- the image of a memory. Like this thing isn't even close to real, right? And that's what he says is like, listen, I'm not this guy. I don't know anything they're talking about, about because my coding omits all of this. And yeah, the real guy could have been this terrible thing, but I'm not, right? I'm I am only what the Federation records show. And that's its own argument. And again, at any point, the doctor and Harry could be like, you know what, maybe this Krell Moset, whatever guy, is a bad pick. Let's hey, you know what? Let's dump this uh, xenobiological database into the fucking Viking lady I fell in love with back in the <laughs> Let's turn it into a hologram of Dr. McCoy. Let's turn her yeah. into a hologram of Dr. Pell. She was a great character. Remember yeah, her before we, we left her out to dry? Yeah. Let's yeah, make really her Fred her. Durst. Let's make her anybody. <laughs> hey, you know what? The computer had a uh, three months worth of learning data. Let's let's dump this database into old Tuvix. Wouldn't he be fun to <laughs> back around? He looked good in a Federation uniform. Oh, so man. they keep the 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 Cardassian that everybody hates. At one point, um, what's his name? Kabor goes and cries to uh, his old Maquis boss and is like, listen, they're using this real nasty guy as their hologram. We should go lynch the hologram. A bunch of us got together. <laughs> we should lynch the hologram. Like what an empty gesture that is like. We can't get the guy who made us mad. So we're going to go make our own version of him. And beat him up and feel like, you know, real big. Like, okay, well, what, what about this? What about he saves Bolana's life and then you guys can just keep that program and have a Nuremberg trial and torture him and everything else? It's just, it's silly. And I get that there might be a portion of the population out there that would feel very passionate about and does feel very passionate about the use of Nazi medical research oh, in yeah, current like- medicine. There, that is the line that would have been useful. It is, oh, I found this in, this specific information from this specific person, and I'm using it, and then I find out how it was, you know, learned, and it's tainted, and that's a that's that's a real ethical dilemma. But they actually set this up in such a way that it's not that. Like from the beginning, they explicitly say it's not just Krelmo sets information. It's actually all of the ship's information about xenobiology into you know the synthesized fake person and so that that ethical dilemma is essentially limited to i learned things by interacting with a database with a personality that happens to be something that people don't like like that is just so thin it's the scope of the stakes like i said earlier it is such an overwhelmingly obvious decision that you save balana's life had they said okay um there is a uh, there's a MacGuffin. The 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 probe from uh, the Delta Flyer episode uh, is in the middle of this planetoid, and we want to get whatever the power crystals are down there. But to get down there, we're going to have to go through some gene therapy so our guys' faces don't melt off or whatever. And over the course of it, hey, listen, there's all this great research we have, and we're going to generate Doctor Mengele. And oh, my God, all of this information we need to get this thing that'll make our life easier and better is going to be using this forbidden, which should be this this tainted knowledge. And now we've got a conundrum where the the stakes are within scope of each other, right? Not she's going to die if we don't cut this thing off and to cut this thing off. We need to use this da- like. Yeah. And you also have directly linked the information to the 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 space problem like rather than it's just so generic is like i don't even see the issue with the information like we're not even to that point of the comparison not only the stakes out of whack they didn't correctly define the parameters of the moral dilemma to make it matter to the audience and also i feel that it was a big omission that at no point does anybody say these bajorans lives were sacrificed and this freedom fighter balana the maquis right like this is an opportunity for those sacrifice lives to mean something and for them not to have just been you know victims that even now from beyond the grave that that they're 
deaths could have a positive impact on the world. I Again, I'm sure there's a lot of very passionate arguments counter to what you and I are saying. But I think there's just some real key components to this that get glossed over and it makes it come off as it feels like Jerry Taylor said, I want to ring a controversy bell and I'm going to ramrod the episode. So we end up in a position where the doctor has to make an ethical choice of do I do I not kill the Nazi? Right. Do what what do we do with this Nazi? There needs to be this big virtuous moment where this guy gets deleted, all the research goes away, whatever, and this choice is made. And she's so focused on like having this virtuous moment that all of the stepping stones to get to that point are just shitty and crooked. And I I feel like she just dragged a hot button topic and, and waved it around like a flag and really didn't do it justice. I can't possibly agree more with you. Uh, the less said about the rest of the episode, I think the better. Um, the the aliens show up. They can't communicate with them because they only they only communicate in yells. <laughs> they, yeah. they, they strictly yell. Uh, they don't seem overtly hostile, though. They're they're they do a pretty good job of using the alien clicky insect language to convey an emotion in a way that like they were frustrated but not but not hostile then at the end when they actually do get the person back like the, their last message does sound a little bit more conciliatory even though you have no idea what's being said aside from that though it's just it's just Janeway and Chakotay you know earning their fucking paycheck for the week um you know trying to figure out how to talk to cicadas I also and- want to touch on hologram rights in this right because the doctor is always disregard well m- Still frequently, I say he's he's disregarded as an actual person. Like, I thought it was good that in the beginning that people actually sit through and tolerate his bullshit slideshow presentation. But I would still say to a certain degree, he's very clearly a second class citizen and expendable, right? As partially, I think that's still true. I think that. Hmm. And certainly nobody else really cares about non EM like the EMH has distinguished himself as much as it can be. Hologram, no one gives a shit. I think uh, Tom's attitude towards this hologram is really a good measuring stick of like, it's a hologram. Who cares? But then again, this this Mel Mo Stiff or whatever, he comes in. Everybody's like, oh, this is guys a fully sentient thing that we're going to demand blood and delete him. And by deleting his database, we're going to feel like we're punishing the real guy. Like, I I think they were trying not to set it up quite that way and trying to set it up about the information. Mm. And it's just came off. It's just both i think yeah and that's what's wrong like that's exactly what's wrong is that they didn't focus themselves correctly on what the fuck you're supposed to even care about yeah that's what's so that's what's so maddening about it uh like the the big emotional crescendo of the episode is supposed to be this briefing room fight that tom has with essentially everyone else yeah and boy oh boy like Tom comes in there and he starts throwing haymakers at Chakotay like what a fucking maquis you are like Mr. You know, like, you know, what I want to follow all the Federation's rules right now. And Volana's life is like, who fucking gives a shit? Let's save our fucking life, people. What the fuck is wrong with everybody here? And, you know, I, I love when Tom is like, fuck all this bullshit. I'm just here to, you know, fucking fly the hot rod and, you know, have my cool Klingon, you know, mechanic girlfriend. Uh, fuck all of this, like, you know, Federation uh, regulation nonsense you guys all seem to care about. There was a very inappropriate flex at the end of the episode because I like the final scene is Janeway, who ultimately says, my decision is that we are going to save the chief engineer's life, obviously, and I will deal with the consequences uh, as my own responsibility. So she goes over to Bolanus quarters, who's recovering. And sporting her, uh, you know, Under Armour tank top. And there's like some incense is burning and she's like, oh, I'm surprised the fire suppression system hasn't turned that off. And it's like, well, obviously, Janeway, like, when have you ever seen that guy? Being playing, like, for starters? <laughs> it, doesn't work in the, it doesn't work in the mess hall. It's not going to work here. It doesn't work anywhere. 
And Balana's like, it's uh, some Klingon incense and it's supposed to clear demons and whatever and, you know, help me. And she's like, well, I trust you weren't happy with my decision. And, uh, you know, I, we need to move past this. And Balana's like, was that an order? And she's like, yeah, it's an order. And Balana has, you know, I think a pretty reasonable explosion. I don't think Balana's choice to die on that table made sense. But I think the trauma she's carrying at this point does make sense. Her direct wishes were disregarded. And we just had an episode this season, again, Extreme Risk, where we see that Blana is fucked up. blana has got some real appropriately placed hatred of the Maquis, of, of uh, the Cardassians, who have at this point exterminated all traces of the Maquis with the help of the um, Dominion, right? And the crew knows she's fucked up. Janeway knows specifically that she's carrying major baggage. And like, I think the way that Janeway acts and it's clear that there's no carry over here. You know, the script was completely ignorant of the events of extreme risk, but it just makes Janeway come off as like just this needlessly cold bitch who doesn't care, who is in no way flexible. You jump back to um, what's the Floxum episode, the storybook one, right? Mm-hmm. where she starts dealing with uh neelix all up in her grill screaming at her and she's like oh wow you're emotionally hurt i'm gonna be very gentle here like here she's like fuck you buck up and like that parting word where she's like you better make sure these incense work because i don't want to deal with this shit ever again like damn man like that's that's cold it's a little i don't know it's, it's jerry taylor fuck you see you later yeah uh, I'm very happy to hear that she's going to have minimal involvement with the show moving forward. And again, for Jerry Taylor, who has had in the past some traditionally very strong feminine voice episodes, like what a what an odd way to end where, you know, the the woman's wishes are completely discarded. And when there's a moment to reflect on that and have some sort of emotional catharsis where there's an understanding instead it's just uh i fucking hate you mom and she's like well you know, fucking chill with your candle then bitch and then that's the end of it like yeah uh, next time i but, see you you better you know unfuck yourself yeah essentially very militaristic which and just did, none of this fit right oh the doctor deletes the program but uh, who who fucking cares that's this the is whole point one of the weakest entries i think into the the doctor centric episodes. Yeah. Like I, I get, there was like a sub line of him, like feeling appreciated by this, of uh, you know, the, the Cardassian murder Mangala. And like, he doesn't feel necessarily appreciated by others, but they don't develop that either. It just, the episode felt underbaked and sloppy and was a disservice to great ideas that could have been their own episodes had they chosen to flesh them out better. And I think it's a disservice to everybody who died in the concentration camps under these Nazi medical experiments that, again, that this thing was just grabbed as a hot button topic and waved. Like, look how righteous we are. Look at this. Look at this woke ass shit we're writing about and just botch it every step of the way, you know, had. And I want to be clear, too, like I'm not pro Nazi, pro Nazi research being you like i'm not defending any of that stuff i'm just saying that the way this episode framed it where someone's about to die you've got a database that's approved federation material and it's only through extreme like they go when you got you're fucking the smartest person in the world seven of nine specifically tasked to hey make this information look dirty really going out of your way to like taint this information and then say okay now we've got a conundrum Again, had it been information that they knew was dirty up front and there was a debate like, hey, do we use this to accomplish our goal, our reasonable goal for the end of the episode? Not do we let Balana die? Do we put everything to a grinding halt and let Balana die? Like it's just it's terrible framing and it's bad virtue signaling and it's a bad episode with bad writing from a bad executive producer. I'm very happy to see no longer involved with the show. (laughs) On that note, she got rid of Kess. Fuck Jerry Taylor. (laughs) She really did. And then saddled us with an entire season of of seven of nine as a consequence. Boy, oh boy, though, like 
the le- using her less is such a benefit to the show though right like yeah. what did you would it it's this ep- this season feels so much different than the one before it on that basis alone yeah what are we watching next week though peter uh season five episode nine 30 days we've got a dude in a red cap with kind of a splotchy looking face he almost looks a little bit like a salamander and it appears he's wearing a federation surgical gown although i'm sure that's not the case in a letter to his father tom paris tells the story of the events leading up to his demolition demotion to ensign and his sentence to 30 days in Voyager's Brick. What a awkwardly placed episode in conjunction with real life events. Uh, in other Trek news, the guy who portrays Admiral Owen Paris, I believe is his name, uh, has passed away. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny that we're kind of going to get our first introduction to to uh, Admiral Paris. Uh, we're right, unfortunately, when the actor two weeks after passed he passed. Off. Yeah, uh, this is uh, you know, at the season five blueprint continues. It's everyone gets their turn in the barrel. Uh, this is the Tom Paris turn in the barrel. Um, I think that this is a great episode for the Tom Paris sort of storyline. So, I uh, kind of remember stuff about this. Again, I've never watched all of Voyager, but there's been a little episode here or there I've picked up in the background. And I, I did know that at some point he does get demoted off a lieutenant. And I believe it's something to do with like, he feels it was super justified, but uh, Janeway sticks to her guns and he slides through death's grip or some, you know, insurmountable odds and comes back feeling pretty sure of himself and gets kicked in the dick as a grounding call. I don't know. This it's I I feel I mean you this is where that happens obviously. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's a extremely well constructed episode because it is just an A plot. So you're just focusing on this. It reminded me a lot of the Pegasus when I when I watched it in terms of like that's about like some shit that Riker had to deal with obviously. Mm-hmm. And like the process that he goes through and the decision that he chooses to make there. Uh so I I would compare it favorably to that. Uh, we'll see if that holds up. But I do remember one extremely important thing about this episode, Peter, and I want to leave you with this teaser. This is the episode where we finally meet the Delaney sisters. Ooh la la. <laughs> <laughs> and until next week, see ya. <laughs> <laughs>